Well, good evening. We finally made it live. Uh, no snow, uh, although we just got the weather report up there on the screen that said it is a wintry mix, whatever that means. But anyway, here we are. We're ready to discuss the midterm exam for FA 255, Understanding Movies, the American Cinema. So let's just jump into it. And let you know that the exam starts this Thursday, February 9th, and it will run through uh, for a week, uh, the 16th. And it will be at the Instructional Testing Services in the Center Building, 311. Um, and uh, the exam will be a computer exam, which, uh, of course, you'll, you'll do on the computer and it is an ob objective exam, and there will be 50 questions. In other words, you're not writing anything. It's not, there are no short answers, uh, questions that involve short answers or essays or anything like that. It is all an objective exam with 50 questions. The good news is, of course, as I mentioned during our previous session, that you are allowed one three by five note card in the testing center. So it has been asked many times, does that mean I can use front and back? And the answer is yes. It's whatever you can get on your 3 by 5 note card. I always, the only advice I give students is that uh, stuff you know, don't bother with. Don't sweat it. Stuff that is a little confusing, give yourself uh, some notes that can inspire you to uh, find the right answer. So anyway, that's how that works. Study guides are now available on Moodle. They will give you pretty much everything, uh, that is the study guide will have listed pretty much everything that was discussed in the video series. So you'll have an idea of what you should know about it. It's, uh, um, so it, 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 it's comprehensive. So there's a lot more there than what's gonna be on the exam. But what it does do is it, it more or less organizes what has been discussed during this first half of our term. Okay, I just want to remind you that you are responsible for your exam. So make sure, as I say this over and over again, because it, nobody pays attention to me, and that is you've got to get in there during their hours of operation. Check the website. They will give you the hours of operation. You know, they'll be open from 9 to 5 or whatever, what, you know, whatever day it is that you plan to take the exam is to check those hours and make sure you can get there at the right time because if you get there five minutes before they close, you're not going to be able to finish the exam. So keep that in mind. All right, moving on. There will be no makeup exams. Um, and, you know, <laughs> just don't give me a call and, and uh, we're going to, okay, we're going to fix the microphone here since it must be driving you nuts out there in TV land, scraping. So we've got it fixed. Um, at any rate, uh, there'll be no makeup exams, and only in, in the sense of, gee, I just didn't feel like taking the exam. And you, you laugh when, you, when I say that. Just last term, I had somebody that said, can I make up the exam? Because I just didn't feel like taking it. Oh, well, we move on. What do you need to know? And this is what this, or this session is all about. The exam, will, the exam will cover material in the classic Hollywood style, which goes all the way back to the first week, through the romantic comedy which is being shown today, or this week. Uh, and it was on today, just before we came on. So everything from the first week through this week will be covered in the exam. So what you need to know, know then is essentially this. We began by looking at the American movie industry. And uh, remember that uh, if we look at it, the, the overview of the American movie industry comprises three things, production, distribution, and exhibition. In other words, when Hollywood begins, when the movies become an industry, they are involved in producing movies, distributing movies, 
to their own theaters, okay? So they are an oligopoly. Also, what is significant to understanding the American movie industry is the use of genre. Genre to minimize financial risk. Okay, keep that in mind that what it is, we make one film that people like. They have, it has all the trappings, all of the stuff that seems to appeal to audiences, as in the Western. Um, and so if they like that, we will make a whole bunch of them. And if those are popular kinds of movies, we should be able to minimize our financial risk. We should be able to make money off of those. And in turn, in the old days of the movie industry, it could subsidize some of our more experimental films or some of our more uh, unique films that don't fit into any kind of popular uh, uh, subject matter. Okay. Also, the history of the motion picture. Uh, be sure, recognize the early projection technology. Understand the theory of persistence of vision. The persistence of vision is that theory, that notion of how movies began to move. The idea that you can take sequential still frames, uh, as in photography, taking sequential still frames that advance a movement, and when they are run through a projection system, when they are copied uh, by a movie camera and then run through the movie projection system, give you the illusion of movement. That's simply persistence of vision. Uh, in the silent era, that ran anywhere from 16 to 18 frames per second, um, depending. But in the sound era, it was standardized to 24 frames per second. So in a sense, what we say then when it was standardized as at the 24 frames uh, intervals like that, what we say is we get motion, we get the illusion of movement at 24 frames per second. Understand the key innovations and the individuals involved. Understand what a kinetoscope was. Understand the contributions of Edison, that's easy, and Dixon, both the people that are in there that are inventing these things, creating these machines that reproduce reality pretty much. Understand the Nickelodeon era, that's the beginnings of what we would call theaters. Um, and uh, also understand the significance of the Motion Picture Patents Company which was in existence roughly from 1908 to 1915 until the the courts ruled that uh, it, was, it was a trust and a monopoly. But uh, the MPPC, that was, you know, Edison's company in which he controlled all production of movies because he controlled the patents on all cameras and so forth. Um, and then understand what they meant by the movie Palace, these huge, beautiful places that more or less were giving to the ordinary person who would pay 25 cents to go in would be like sitting in a plush movie set itself. This is when you had huge theaters that would seat 2,000 people and they would have their own motif and they would be called, uh, uh, the, the theaters would be called like uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater. They would have a motif, a theme of China or the Egyptian theater, places like that. Okay, moving on. The classic narrative style. They spent much time dealing with this, and it is important because they, what they do is they look at the ways in which cinematic stories are told, and they gave to us pretty much five important concepts, and there they are. The first one is equilibrium and disruption. And what that means, based on our own book, is that an initial state of affairs is introduced after which something occurs to disturb this equilibrium. That is pretty simple when you, when you stop and think about it. With all the movies that you've ever seen in your entire life, just about, that they usually start in the middle of something. We're introduced to something like whatever it may be, and in, in, a, in the simplest way, we are introduced to, some, it's calm, everything is in order, and something happens that disrupts that order. It's that simple. Okay, so 
That's our plotting right there. That's how Hollywood movies begin to tell us a story, is that we enter into it when things are normal, when things are calm, when things are cool, collected, when everything seems to be in order, but something happens that disrupts that, and it can be anything. Often it is a person or persons, it are they, the villains who do something, who come into town or who, who are th already there or do something that disrupts everything. And of course, it has to be restored, which brings us to number two, that subsequent events attempt to restore the original status quo. But this is repeatedly frustrated and order is recovered only at the end of the film. So essentially what that is, is, you know, along comes something that tries to right it, tries to bring order back to it. There are attempts to do this, but it, most of those attempts fail, or often they don't do enough. But we do find order at the end of the film. Okay, the next thing, problem solving. Problem solving. As the book states, over the course of the narrative, Characters struggle to achieve their goals or solve their problems. Okay, what we have there is, for example, uh, with regard to achieving a goal, is uh, movies that take us on a journey, that you're leaving from point A to get to point B, and your goal, of course, is to get point B, and you are met with frustration as you get there. Uh, this can be any kind of a, a journey type thing in which uh, it could be explorers uh, exploring some lost land. Uh, you know what it is. It's, it's that kind of a thing. With regard to solving problems, often this is introspective. Often this is subtle in some films in which as the person, it could very easily be, as a person is on a journey, they, they have their own problems, their inner problems that they must, they must solve. In an exterior way, the solving the problems would be detective shows, mystery shows in which you are trying to solve the case. So that's how that one works. Number two is, of course, our characters do overcome, overcome those who stand in their way. They triumph over adverse circumstances and or transcend their own limitations. So often that is found within, us, uh, within the character itself they discover their own limitations, and uh, as such, they also learn how to overcome them, um, or, and as it says there, transcend their limitations. Okay, number three, temporal and spatial limits. The temporal dimension is exactly what it means. A specific deadline has to be met, or a certain task has to be completed by a definite time. This deems, simply deals with time. You have a certain amount of time to get the job done. Uh, deadlines are facing you constantly. I always think of that 1949 film noir called DOA, in which the main character has been poisoned, and uh, there's no antidote for it. Antidote for it, and so, uh, but in the, the the film, he has a certain amount of time <laughs> before he dies, obviously. Uh, and during that time, he has to find the guy that poisoned him. He's looking for his killer. So there, time is of the essence. Spatial dimension, exactly what that says. The characters move toward precise destinations or geographical goals. Now, often this idea of, of moving toward a destination can also be moving toward your own personal destination. You can, you're, you're moving towards, like we, we talked about earlier, about a goal that you have or transcending yourself, transcending your limitations or whatever. But for the most part, it deals specifically with what it says right there, and that is a spatial dimension, that you are actually moving in, in space to get to some location. Okay, and all of that involves pretty much, we've already brought this up, and most of this involves a journey. And our programs talk about the journey with regard to the narrative. Characters move not only spatially, but they realize other non-spatial goals as well, making deadlines, solving mysteries, falling in love, discovering new worlds, and coming to terms with themselves and or their fellow travelers. So that is the journey. It is the figurative journey, of course, of myth. 
in which someone embarks on this journey that takes them from wherever to wherever. And it can be a personal journey in some films, uh, character studies. Uh, it is definitely a metaphor. A journey becomes this, uh, 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 a, a person uh, growing within themselves, something of that nature. Our video programs, as well as the book, also mention that the journey involves the audience's journey in the sense that we refer to it as going to the movies. What we see on the screen is what we are doing at that very moment. We are looking for goals, participating in deadlines, and undertaking journeys with the characters that we see. It is that vicarious experience that we have in watching a movie and how we get involved with characters. Uh, it's kind of rough at times in today's Hollywood, today's movies, to really get involved in this because we really don't care too much about the characters. The characters that we see aren't any better than the villains that we see. It's that kind of, uh, they like to write this thing that everybody is equal and there's no such thing as a hero, no such thing as, you know, these kinds of things. So it's hard for us to really care about that, but we do get involved with the journey anyway. We do embark on a journey that lasts roughly two hours. Okay, and then finally, they want to talk about the traditional drama, especially that that created by Aristotle, the first to more, to more or less give us theory of drama, and, um, and, and, and Hollywood filmmaking, which they call segmentation. And what is that? Segmentation is a process of structural analysis. In, which, in other words, we analyze the structure that we're seeing that breaks the film down into its basic narrative units. Okay, now, people involved in film production, people who like to produce movies can recognize this right away because that's what we get with a script. We know that a script is broken down into narrative units. And when we produce a film, we break it down into certain little units, film them today, film them tomorrow, film them the next day, and so on, for it to form a unified whole. Now, with regard to Aristotle's idea, which was action, time, and space, what we know about films is that they violate those traditional unities and lend themselves to segmentation. It's that simple. Uh, we often can break everything down when we see a film and break it down into those scenes and sequences and look at them individually and to see how they do relate to other sequences and scenes and so forth. So, okay, that's pretty much that technique. Now, fil or, or, or pretty much the narrative. The techniques in relationship to narrative were discussed in all of these things that you see here. I won't go through a lot of those with detail because you can, you, you can look those up if you're a little confused about wh how, which, how they work. But do have an understanding of mise-en-scene. That is essentially what you see within the frame of the movie. It's everything within that frame. It's everything that you see here, as you see in this frame here, and there is nothing beyond that frame. So mise-en-scene is looking solely within that frame. Uh, understand the cam camera movement techniques, you know, we understand how the camera moves. It can, you know, it simply can pan, you know, across uh, this, you know, this direction here, right to left, left to right, and so forth. It can also uh, move up and down, which is tilting on a camera like that. Or it can crane, which moves up um, sometimes with a, an individual or with a subject, but often that gives us one of those fantastic shots that they use drones now to get. Um, and so understand that kind of a thing. Lighting, the different types of lighting and the effects. Understand three-point lighting. Uh, that's the basic setup. Uh, if you have a large, huge auditorium or whatever, and you've got lots of cast members and everything, they're going to break that down almost in segments according to three-point lighting. You will have lots of little uh, parts of that that will be shot in three-point lighting. Uh, the sound, you know, that we have microphones, we have mixing, scoring, continuity of sound. 
uh, and also know the difference between a shot and a scene. Basically, you know, I mean, I can't make it any clearer. A shot is simply turn the camera on, turn the camera off. That's what a shot is. A scene is a dramatic unit. That's the difference between those two things. Understand scene editing uh, between scenes and within scenes. It's also known as when we, when we talk about cutting within a scene, that is, uh, with Hollywood, it is often referred to as invisible editing, and that's when you cut among close-up, uh, uh, medium shot, close-up, uh, long shot, uh, two shot, over-the-shoulder shot, those kinds of things that are within a scene, and also the editing between scenes. In the old days, in the very beginnings of film, those scenes, uh, editing between scenes, the basic uh, kind of transition was a fade, and then we discovered the dissolve. Um, I always loved this André Bazin, the great, great French uh, critic, um, theorist, uh, always said there's one unique thing about films that no other art form has. No other literature doesn't have it. Painting, none of it has it, and that is the dissolve. So right he was. We seldom see the dissolve today because most of the films today use jump cuts. Scene organization, okay, whether it's linear, circular, flashback, you know, it can be like in Citizen Kane where it's a flashback within a flashback within a flashback and works its way back into the modern, uh, into the, the current uh, scene. It's, uh, so it's, it's, how do they organize that? Cross-cutting. Uh, developed in the, in the uh, early stages of film, uh, you know, 1903, um, with uh, the great train robbery, in which uh, we are actually cutting among sequences that create for us a unified idea. And it's very simple. Cross-cutting is you've got the woman tied to the railroad tracks, you see the train coming down the railroad tracks. You've got the, the hero on the horse racing towards the, the woman to release her from the railroad tracks before the train gets there, and we cut among those three disparate things, but it creates for us a unity in the sense of all these things are happening at the same time. That's cross-cutting. Point of view editing, that's simply who, whose point of view are we seeing? Um, uh, most of the time, it's just an objective, uh, third-person point of view. We're just peeking in on things that are, <laughs> that are happening. And sometimes we jump in there with the a character's eyes, and we see things occurring the way the character would see it. And it's a filmmaking rule. It's to maintain continuity, and that's the 180-degree rule, which is you just draw a line, and you don't cross that line and the camera stays on that other side of that line so that it maintains continuity if you're, well, you've seen it when you're cross-cutting, or not actually cross-cutting, but when you're cutting within a scene, dialogue sequences, so it appears as those, those people who are in close-up, those people who are looking at another character, they're, uh, the, 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 what they're seeing is, is continuous. It looks like, you know, it's a continuity thing. Okay, moving on. We've got to get going here. Um, the studio system, understand that. A very fascinating uh, subject that they went through, and I really appreciated this one. Uh, understand all that stuff about the Motion Picture Patents Company and the key players in the creation of that early studio system. These are the individuals who created the movie industry as we know it. People like William Fox, Carl Lemley, Louis B. Mayer, Samuel Goldwyn, Marcus Lowe. The strategies of control, we already mentioned that. Oligopoly, which is vertical inter integration. They own production, distribu uh, production, distribution, and exhibition. Understand those terms of blind booking and block booking, however, you know how that works is you got to buy, you know, to the theater owners, you got to buy a whole bunch of our movies without ever seeing them. If you want to see one of our great pictures and all of that sort of thing, and the run zones, clearances, so forth. And the Sherman Antitrust ruling against the MPCC in 1915, which kind of freed uh, in, uh, the movie industry. You can, anybody can make a movie now. 
the five major studios, Paramount Pictures, Lowe's Incorporated, which is also MGM, the same thing, uh, William Fox's company that merges with Daryl Zanuck's 20th Century Pictures to form 20th Century Fox, the Warner Brothers and RKO Radio Pictures, and then also the three minor studios, Universal, Columbia, and United Artists. Low-budget filmmakers, they're right in the middle of all of this. These are the people that uh, count pennies and yet are able to make some interesting films. And there's a whole list of all of the companies there um, that are considered poverty row. Okay, and the Department of Justice Paramount case in 1948. That's when it, you had to, that's when the studios had to break up that oligopoly. They had to get rid of one of those things, either production, distribution, or exhibition, and of course they all got rid of theaters. When that, after, when that broke up, the current film production is that most Hollywood studios are just financiers. They just, uh, as it says down there, d distributors of independently made films. And the average cost of film production over time, you, <laughs> everybody knows that. It is <laughs> quadrupled, if not more. And the rise of film artisans, independent film producers, and so forth. Okay. Also, recognize the star. And recognize that what they talked about was that the stars have masks or personas that are created by film studios. Um, and the role of the mass media and public in making and breaking stars. And it's pretty much you're left up to the public. They can very easily, uh, you can fall out of favor with them. Uh, blacks and other minority stars, and they, specifically the, the breakthrough with Sidney Poitier, uh, the black exploitation movies that occurred in the 70s, really some odd, bizarre movies. Um, and uh, since the breakup system, stars can make it via other media, for example, music and television. Okay, genre. This is the significant part here is that genre, we already mentioned this, but genre is, it makes stable an otherwise unstable movie industry. And we go through the Western, which is distinctly American, based on dime novels and real life characters. The three essential ingredients, the hero, the villain, the landscape. Symbolism is East meets West, it's fact meets fiction, culture versus nature, culture conflicts and so forth. That's all outlined for you in the book. And then the final one is space films, which is considered the final frontier, because in this particular type of uh, movies, they basically follow the Western pattern. American comedy, comic expression of so is of social repression. Uh, the themes of American uh, uh, comedy are racism, social disintegration, and um, this sort of thing, class, democracy, that is explained. I'll have a good understanding of the popular comedy actors. Uh, in silent comedy, slapstick, it was uh, certainly exemplified by Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. With sound, it changes to verbal wit, and you get Laurel and Hardy and the Marx Brothers. And the one person, Harold Lloyd, is really the only silent star who successfully transcended to sound. Okay, the romantic and screwball comedy, you know, it's a hybrid of the romantic and the, and the slapstick. And I'm not going to go through all of those things. Uh, you can find those on there because we are just about out of time. And if you are confused and bewildered and rattled and depressed and desperate, then stop by during office hours or send an email and I will get back to you with the best answer I can come up with. And remember, the study guide is now available. It is on uh, Moodle, so you can download it. Positively no makeup exams, and you're responsible for your exam, and that's it. Thanks for watching, and see you later. Bye. Yeah. Ah, you have any questions? <laughs>